Good evening, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to a, another edition on Relentless Pursuit of Purpose. Our goal here is to help everyone enter into a confirmed, confident, and eternal relationship with the source of all life and purpose. Please make sure if you haven't already done so that you hit the subscribe button and click the bell so that you never miss a video or an interview. I also want to note that due to some uh, scheduling situations, this interview is coming to you pre-recorded with my guests, Troy and Chuck. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get into the discussion. Again. And I really do think that the day-to-day, -day, the on-the-ground work that you all do is really the key to, to solving this issue as far as uh, racial harmony and all those types of things. So I really want to help people have some practical tools to take away especially any pastors that are watching. With that being said, uh, Chuck, thank you for being here. Happy uh, to be here, Alex. Yes. Uh, so for those that don't know, uh, Chuck, Troy, and I, we met each other at the Matthew 5-9 Fellowship Retreat. Uh, Matthew 5-9 is an amazing organization. Maybe you all can talk more about that. You've been a part of it a lot longer than I have, but it's a, it's a great grouping of like-minded doers of the work. Uh, that's key. And we can talk a little bit more about that as we go forward. But Chuck, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself for everyone? I will. Yeah. So great to be with you. And again, sorry for our lighting as we are um, in a different space today. But Chuck Mingo and I have been for the last uh, 15, 16 years, um, been a pastor at Crossroads Church in Cincinnati, where I am one of the teaching pastors there. Um, but in 2015, um, really began to get a stirring in me about um, being a bridge builder, being, uh, you know, pursuing the work of racial healing and justice. And uh, out of that launched a ministry called Undivided. And now I lead that ministry as it's expanding across the country with an amazing team. And um, really what we do is activate churches, communities to um, pursue the work of racial healing, solidarity and justice in their communities. And we do that from a faith and biblical lens. Um, married for 20 years to my wonderful wife, Maria. I've got three kids. Um, and call Cincinnati, Ohio home, which means it's a it's an okay year for our football team. Um, <laughs> we'll see how they end up. <laughs> yeah. uh, as a as a Chi Town guy, uh, you probably <laughs> have your own thoughts about that. But <laughs> yes, <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's a bit about me. Yeah, you guys were definitely at the pinnacle uh, a lot more re recently than we were. So, <laughs> 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 all right. Well, thank you for being here, um, Troy Jackson. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Troy Jackson. A longtime pastor of a church in Cincinnati. Uh, the last 10 or 15 years have been very involved in community organizing, which has involved getting people of faith involved in the work of racial justice, the local and state level. Uh, also a, an academic of sorts. So I have a doctorate in civil rights history and have worked a lot on the papers of Martin Luther King. And so bring kind of those different angles. And I've been part of the team that Chuck built back in 2015 I am privileged and blessed to work for Chuck and be part of the team of Undivided here in 2022. Awesome. Awesome. And, and as you brought that up, that's kind of where uh, I like to start. So let me just read for everyone kind of the mission and vision uh, for Undivided. Um, you can get more web, uh, information on, the, on this at the website. What's the website? Undivided.com. Undivided.com. Can't, can't forget that. <laughs> so it says undivided moving congregations toward racial reconciliation and justice. Um, or or that, I guess that's kind of what you guys were talking about at the time I saw you. Also in the kind of breakdown, it says participants will hear the story of undivided, a six week racial reconciliation and justice journey launched at one of the largest and fastest growing congregations in the nation, Crossroads Church in Cincinnati. Over 4,000 people at Crossroads have experienced Undivided so far, which is awesome. And a dozen other congregations are launching Undivided this year. Participants will learn best practices, participate in experiential learning, and explore what it would take to launch Undivided or a similar effort in their context. Mm -hmm. So if you want to unpack more on that uh, without giving everything away, either one of you. Yeah, I will. I mean, actually, I... I, what, I, I'd love to know where you got that because that's actually that's information that was probably um, around 2018. We were just kind of going public for the first time. Um, at this point, it's been over 10,000 people who've experienced Undivided. Um, we've had engagement from over 100 cities over the last several years. We've done about 85 or so cohorts wow. in the last 20 months. Um, and wow. a cohort for us is a group of you know anywhere from 
20 to 25, 26 people who go on that six week immersive experience, as you said. And, and really it's around three things. I mean, I think about what we do, it's really around um, awareness, relationships, and action. Mm. And we really feel like those are the three things that need to be a part of, um, quite frankly, helping people be spiritually formed to think about race from a biblical perspective. So awareness, we do that through history. As you heard, Troy's got an incredible pedigree in civil rights history. Um, but we also do that by rooting people in scripture. What does the Bible have to say about this? How does this play out in our Christian faith? And so that's really the awareness piece. But that happens in and through experiences that bring people together to share stories. And there's just such power in that. You know, there's power in the proximity of hearing someone else's story. And one of the things we say is we all have a story when it comes to race. We can often think that that's only true for black, indigenous or people of color. But we've all been shaped by what's in the water around racism in our country, around the racial hierarchy that we live in. And from a spiritual standpoint, it's important to kind of understand how we've been impacted by this cultural influence, if you will. And then really what we wanna do is give people an imagination, a biblical imagination of what does it look like to get active in the work of, you know, to use language that would be holistic, the restoration of shalom, the restoration of peace. That's what we're pursuing when we talk about things like justice. Um, you know, I love it says in Psalms, obviously righteousness and justice flow from God's throne. So we're pressing into something that we believe is at the heart of God and at the heart of the gospel. Absolutely. Couldn't say it better. Troy, did you have anything you wanted to add on as far as you've been going around in these last uh, couple years? Yeah, I think um, to just to add to what Chuck said, and I love this idea of justice and righteousness flowing from God's throne. Um, we have developed a true north. Uh, or North Star for our organization, which that we're longing to see a flow of racial healing and justice that repairs wounds and cultivates equitable systems where all people flourish. And we look at Ezekiel 47, which Ezekiel's a prophet in a time of uh, a time of captivity, a time uh, when they are uh, far from Jerusalem, far from Israel. Uh, and they are having to imagine what is it like to follow God faithfully uh, during a time when all seems lost. And I don't know if that sounds a little bit familiar right now. <laughs> in terms of everything we thought, it feels like it's crumbling and breaking down around us. Things we thought about the church, things we thought about our, our kindred in Christ, things we thought about this nation, uh, it seems to be falling apart a little bit, and yet there's this vision for a not only a rebuilt temple, but for a flow of God's Spirit that uh, along the banks, and this is uh, Ezekiel 47, water flowing from the temple, and along the banks, as the water gets deeper, are trees mm. with fruit for the nation and leaves that bring healing, and Lord knows we need healing. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and I need healing. My brother uh, Chuck needs healing. Sorry. The people we work with, Alex, I don't want to be so presumptuous, but I'm saying <laughs> probably you me and my family, those you know, need healing. And that yeah. healing comes from Jesus. And we ought to be the hands and feet of being agents of healing in the world. And then that water goes all the way down to the Dead Sea. Uh, and the Dead Sea, like if, if you or I decided, let's go float, you can't swim in the Dead Sea, you can float in it. If you float, you float too long, you die. Because it's so filled with salt that it's so, it actually dehydrates us as human beings. Mm -hmm. Imagine that sea coming to life. And that's what Ezekiel imagines while in captivity uh, in Babylon, that the dead things can come to life. People are fishing. And so I love to imagine a church coming to life and a, a communities coming to life because of this work that uh, if we're not embodying it across race and across ethnicity and across difference, we're robbing some of the power of the gospel. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we want to be part of that flow. Mm -hmm. Amen. That, that's awesome. I was actually talking to somebody um, at a different retreat and kind of giving them some advice, but they, it was with regards to a team that they're overseeing coaching FCA related. Anyway, the one of the things I left them with is that, the understanding, at least biblically, that when I hurt you, Troy, I'm actually hurting myself. Ooh, that's because right. if we're a body, that's right. It's, it's just like me cutting my own body. You know, mm -hmm. when that's I had good. when I needed surgery, I wanted my whole body fixed. I want the whole body whole. 
and getting i think the power the power of that imagery of body yes is so that. powerful yeah. because we all mm -hmm. understand across generation across cultures across everything we understand man i want my whole body intact <laughs> right? really <use> that. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> so um and i'm actually part of a, a racial reconciliation dialogue with a group a cohort that we kind of just created um mm -hmm. we didn't know about this so mm -hmm. my friend actually just him and another pastor created it and it's been maybe almost two years now going strong yeah. um, where it started out with 20 white, 20 black and, you know, people filtered it out, but mm -hmm. the, the relationships that have been created, the understanding that's been gained and with you guys doing this on a mat, essentially what I'm doing, but on a much bigger scale, this is the reason I said this in the, in the, in the, in the thumbnail will bring racial harmony because it takes one-on-one -on -one human to human conversation. Like if we do, if we, the church do what you guys are doing well and broadly, we don't need to talk about CRT and all this other nonsense. Mm -hmm. This is the biblical way to do it right. And if we do this, we don't have to worry about all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I do a lot of trying to debunk or disassociate from CRT or whatever, but mm -hmm. that's only because it's unnecessary if we're doing what you guys are talking about. So mm -hmm. I love it. Well, mm -hmm. let me just ask the kind of the, the 30,000 foot question. Mm -hmm. And I know this is a huge answer. Just kind of give me a couple points on here. Mm -hmm. Why does racial harmony elude us in the first place? And then what will it cost us mm -hmm. to achieve unity if we can? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think, you know, very similar. And that's why we love your ministry is, you know, we take everything to the story of God. You know, the, the Bible is telling one story, right? Right. And the story is about, you know, how God created the world perfect. And that also meant that both the vertical relationships and the horizontal relationships in the world were as they should be. Right. Um, but to answer the first part of your question, why does racial harmony elude us? It's because we're fallen people. Mm. It's because in this in this current reality of the story, we fall short of God's ideal in the relationship with him, which is why we needed a savior. And it's also true. And it plays out in our vertical, in our horizontal relationships as well. Um, and so I think that's why it eludes us is because we're fallen people. And, and it's funny because, you know, race, race is used to divide and yet we're all common in our fallenness, <laughs> we're common in our brokenness. Right. Um, and, and I think it, it continues to elude us also because in some ways we have, um, we've not contextualized racism as a sin that is relevant in the mm. American church. And when I say that, I'm talking about historically, that's not always been part of the broad way that people are discipled. I, I use this analogy oftentimes, Alex, is like if you and I were going to go and plant a church in Burundi, mm -hmm. we would we would go over there and we would understand the culture. Yep, we'd I've been there too. Cultural yeah. artifacts. You've been to Burundi, right? So, <laughs> so, so we'd want to understand that. And then we'd be looking for redemptive analogies. We'd be looking mm -hmm. for the things that are already in that culture that we can tie to the broader story. This is what Paul did when he was at, you know, Mars Hill in Athens, right? He said, hey, you got these, you got these statues. You got this one to an unknown God. Let me, let me make him known to you. Mm -hmm. And I think in some ways we've missed the gospel opportunity in the church to talk about what does it mean to move from slavery to freedom? And what does it move, mean to move from divided to undivided and how this gospel is a gospel of reconciliation? It's a gospel of restoring relationships. But if that's going to have power, then that has to be modeled. And so that's why it's so important that the church is leading on this and talking about this and doing work in this space is because the power of what we proclaim has to match what's being demonstrated in our relationships with each other. So I'm getting into a little bit of maybe how we move toward um, a solution, but I mean, honestly, it's, this is part of our fallen condition. So yeah. I'll let, I'll let Troy pick it up from there. <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Troy. It's a great question. And I would a thousand percent co-sign what Chuck said and add part of the impulse of, I'm going to say part of the impulse of empire is division. Mm. And I wonder if that's not why Paul had to spend so much time trying to repair division between Jew and Gentile mm. is because part of how you dominate other people mm. is through um, elevating difference and uh, making harmony very difficult. Yeah. And so letter after letter that Paul is writing is trying to help people recognize that in Jesus, there is no Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, right? right? And part of the impulse that emerged with the uh, founding of this country 
was an impulse around uh, embedding democracy based on who didn't get to participate to make democracy safe. Mm. So if you're going to let people vote, let's make sure they're the people that are qualified to vote, i.e. white male landowners. Mm. And then we might tweak that over the years, but but then what happens out, it's, I mean, that's one thing for a nation state. It's another when followers of Jesus begin to look to God to, uh, to rubber stamp and endorse mm. division, to rubber stamp and endorse uh, slavery, to rubber stamp and endorse white supremacy. And, and that's what happened. There were attempts, and they were ra- rather sadly successful, to intertwine a fallen part of our nature with our understanding of the church and Jesus. Mm. And then it got white Christianity as it were kind of got bubbled off because part of the way that gets circumvented, because let me say this, Alex, I think that's a temptation for every group of people. Yeah. And part of the reason we're invited not to get stuck in our bubble or echo chamber is because I need Chuck. I need an Alex. I need people. I need a Sun Chan Ra. I need, a um, Mark Charles, who's Native American. Mm-hmm. Uh, I need brothers and sisters in Jesus who can help me see beyond my myopia and my blind spots. Yes. Jack has a great uh, uh, frame uh, and talk that that he gives on different lenses we use uh, and and how they get in our way. One of the best ways I've been able to overcome my myopia, my blind spots, and the lenses that I have as a white guy who turns 54 today Happy uh, birthday. <laughs> in America is, is through relationships where people are checking me and people are inviting me and even not checking me, hearing them articulate their faith invites me into a more rich understanding of God's yes. mm-hmm. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I, I think, uh, you know, co-pastoring a house church, I see this all the time where, you know, we prepare the word, but because of the nature of how we even engage in it, yeah, all, so many people from different walks of life. Yeah, we know them, but you know they didn't go to seminary or anything like that. And we get this other these other perspectives. Not to say, oh, if you're you know young white male, you have this perspective and you have this. And right. actually, that's actually the beauty of it that the people you think would think a certain way don't, and right. vice versa. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's a beautiful thing too. And so then we can come back and say, okay, well we still agree Jesus <laughs> died and rose again. So we're good. Right. <laughs> like, you know, I, I don't, I think sometimes the division, it's almost like society sells us division. You said something, tr- Chuck, and I didn't think about it this way until now. Cause typically we think, Oh, division is bad. Like that's the, right. And, and it is, mm-hmm. but sometimes depending on who you are, division is good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, if you don't care about the other people, like it can benefit your group if you do it right. Oh, absolutely, right. And so, a right. um, friend of mine, Jerome Gay, wrote this yeah. book. Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow. Yes. Mm-hmm. And um, he talks about how it was deliberate, dishonest, and deceitful. Ooh. Those are those are different categories because one mm-hmm. is intentional, one's not right. necessarily intentional. Yeah, yeah. That's right. But to both of your points, to your point, Troy, some of this stuff was absolutely intentional. Yes. With known conclusions and for sinful reasons. Like just that's it is what it is. And so until we're just honest about that, like you said, historically, it's going to be hard to move forward if we can't. You can't apologize for something you don't believe you did. <laughs> well, and, and that's one thing I would say to that, too, is that the part of the insidiousness of it is that these decisions were often made generations ago. And so there's a whole host of white people that say, I never decided that there was nothing deliberate about this. And then. I'm absolved or I don't understand or why don't we get over it because there hasn't been this reckoning with how it's baked in. Yeah. Mm. Baked which is, in. Yeah. which is, uh, which is such a, just to point out a spiritual principle around how do we move forward? One of my favorite scriptures to talk about when I think about racial healing is second Corinthians seven ten, which says that godly sorrow mm. leads to repentance, which brings more salvation and leaves no regret. Yes. And, and I think there's a process there around godly sorrow, reckoning, owning what has happened, right? Which leads to a, a, a repentance and a, and a repentance that doesn't lead to more shame, but actually a repentance that leads to more salvation and no regret. I think sometimes the reasons that we're stuck in guilt 
cycles in the country around this is because there's not been a godly sorrow and a repentance. Mm. Um, so it doesn't leave us in a place of no, uh, of no regret. Um, and I think about the fact that, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent, we have seen in other countries where a spiritual process of truth and reconciliation has had an impact. Right. So I think about, you know, the work in Rwanda that happened after the genocide. I think about the work, obviously, in South Africa that was really catalyzed by Bishop Desmond Tutu. Um, and, 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 and again, not to say that those are perfect countries and they don't have any problems, but there is a sense in which a national wound has had a level of healing mm. because there's been a godly sorrow that led to repentance that brought more salvation and didn't leave regret. And I, and I just I long for that. I long for that in the American conversation, quite frankly, as a follower of Jesus. I long for that. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. And since you brought him up, I'm going to do a little plug for uh, Professor Soon Chan Ra. Uh, yep. If y'all don't know who he is, he's been on my channel before, too. But um, he's a professor actually out here in Chicago at North Park. So anybody watching, please pick up his books. He talks a lot about lament yes. and the purpose and the necessity for it. And we don't talk about that enough in church at all, you know, <laughs> and, and in general. In any, in any yeah. way, right. In Not anyway. even right, just in any way, right. In, in any way, right. Um, one, unfortunately for Chicago, Sunshine just moved out to uh, L.A. So he's at Fuller. Oh, he did? Uh, yeah, so he's at Fuller in Pasadena. But um, okay. I was on a project with him called Forgive Us mm -hmm. that wow. actually came out about eight years ago. And it was a look at the historic sins of the American church. And by project, he means book. So a he, 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 he co-authored a book. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it John Ra, Lisa Sharon Harper and May Cannon. And it looks at um, several historic sins of the American church, more outward facing. So we weren't talking about the internal stuff. But um, and then uh, there's a, a part of lament and theological reflection around those histories mm. that might be of interest to folks. But yeah, Sing John's a friend and actually just saw him today. So Okay, good. Yeah, well, no, that's awesome. And and I and I want to I'm, I'm big on bi practical I'm being orthopraxy, um, yeah. you know, doing and that's what that's part of the reason I love Matthew 5, 9 and the vision of it. And actually, let me before I even get in, can you guys just give a little plug about what Matthew 5, 9 is and does and what they want to promote? Yeah, I mean, you know, I and I, I feel a little bit under <laughs> undersourced because there are people from Fat Matthew 5, 9 who would yes. put this much more eloquently than me. But really what they've done is call together peacemakers. You know, blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus said. And uh, Matthew 5, 9 recognized that particularly in the Christian space and even I would say maybe even the evangelical space, that there was a need to bring together pastors and leaders who are doing this peacemaking work, whether it be racial bridge building. Some people are doing it across gender. Some people are doing it across, um, you know, even with other other faiths and kind of bringing multi-faith efforts to it. But but as as particularly from a Christian perspective, how do we resource each other? How do we encourage each other to stay in the long, hard good work of peacemaking. And so that's what Matthew 5, 9 does. And it's an incredible fellowship that, you know, offers gatherings and resources. They just did a great one on, you know, how to think about social media and not let it be such a divisive tool and how to equip other people in your church or your leadership to think about it the same way. So it's a great organization. Yeah. I noticed Chuck said uh, peacemakers and not peacekeepers. Hmm. Hmm. So peacekeepers try to tamp down any tension, yeah. keep things like, uh, just uh, wallpaper over anything that doesn't look pretty. No, what, what Matthew 5, 9 does is, and hopefully, you know, I think what this is what I pick up from what I know of you, Alex, and what we're trying to do in Divided is to be actual peacekeepers that... Peacemakers. And I'm mm -hmm. sorry, peacemakers. <laughs> thank you. Peacemakers uh, that are really leaning into and not yes. avoiding. Um, and I think of, um, of Romans 12, which talks about do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. And so many of those divisions are in are uh, are basically uh, wooing the church to mm. be conformed to the pattern of this world. That's and for the divisions, the toxic things of this world are penetrating the church mm. and actually flowing out of the church in even more toxicity than they came in right now. So yeah. how do we give pastors and leaders the courage, the support, the encouragement to instead uh not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds that we might test and approve God's will. I think it says about God's good, good and pleasing, pleasing and, and perfect, perfect will. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. Well, that's a great segue. Um, and Troy, I want to ask you, 
when we were at the uh, retreat, I remember you talked about this concept of mobilizing versus organizing. And yeah. so let me just kind of set up something that I want to ask you because you did your dissertation on the Montgomery bus boycott, you know, deep dive into that. Like we all know surface level stuff, but you did a deep dive into that. And then you talked about the, the connection with the institution and, and the fact that they brought King in. So we know King now historically, but I don't think a lot of people know the history of how that got mobilized and how that got organized. Yeah. Um, and I want to read one more thing. I think you said this institutions still matter. So we don't want to disband them, but influence them. And I think you talked about the new Richmond churches that refused to work with churches that supported slavery. And I'm bringing all this up because there's a lot of talkers and there's a lot of doers. There's not a lot of both. Mm-hmm. And or from my experience in, in church world, I, I hear, I remember coming to some meetings sometimes and people always had these great ideas, great suggestions ain't showed up to an event in a year, <laughs> ain't, ain't put a food, food on the ground, ain't served a meal, ain't done nothing. But as soon as the meeting comes, oh, we should do it. Yeah, we tried that. It didn't work. You weren't here to see. So, right. Right. <laughs> so I think there's a lot of, there's, there's a lot of trial and error in this work. I mean, there's not, it's not pretty work. It's um, some of these conversations that you have and that I have with people are not, not easy. I'm going in jails. And so this is not the sexy work that people, I don't know who thinks it is, but it's not, <laughs> but it needs to be done. And especially if you're a believer and a, and a leader in ministry, yeah. especially, I don't know how this isn't an everyday burden to do something, mm-hmm. even if you're not doing this, like to do, mm-hmm. to be active. I get, I get claustrophobic when I'm not able to do something. And so that was a lot, a big setup, but I want you to unpack the difference yeah. the connection between organizing and mobilization. Yeah, so mobilizing is powerful, and it tends to be, when it's most effective, reactionary. Hmm. So George Floyd is murdered, and there are mobilizations around the country. Right. There was probably, there were several in Chicago, Columbus, Cincinnati, where Chuck and I were living at the time. And some of it was who put the first invite mm. on Facebook that got any traction. That's how people came together. Right. And those are important, I think, uh, and, and have a role to play. But imagine if after Rosa Parks got arrested on December 1st, 1955, that Joanne Robinson and the Women's Political Council had said, let's have a protest outside the bus company mm-hmm. in downtown Montgomery. That would, could have been an appropriate thing. It wouldn't have been bad, but it wouldn't have been channeling anything that had the power to sustain itself. Mm. Instead, they had the rigor and discipline and strategy to organize people over time through a vehicle that they created called the Montgomery Improvement Association there was a lot of discipline. There was the need to pull together resources. There was a need to figure out, okay, if, if, if uh, my aunt is serving as a um, domestic worker at this white family's house, that's 12 miles from where she lives. Can we develop a carpool? How do we get her? So she doesn't have to walk 25 miles every day back and forth. How do we begin to come together as a community doing a, doing uh, at the beginning twice a week assemblies to praise God, to sing, to hear encouraging testimony from the word of God and to hear instruction and updates. So that's what organizing begins to do. And, and let me suggest that the, uh, that if, if all that Montgomery had done is a protest or maybe weekly protests for two months that started out with 10,000 people, and by two months in, there were three there, or 30. The bus company knows how to wait that out. Yeah. Those in power know how to wait that out. But when it's a strategy that actually uh, is well-honed and, and has good leadership and people are on board, that's channeling power, which Dr. King called the ability to achieve purpose. Mm. And what is important to know about the Montgomery bus boycott is 
not only was Rosa Parks someone who just spontaneously protested, Rosa Parks had been undergoing intense development and formation. One is a, a child of God and a follower of Jesus. And two is someone who was committed to the work of racial justice for well over a decade. Hmm. It was not new. There was also a group of women called the Women's Political Council who had been organizing and were not taken seriously by anybody hmm. because they were black women. I say in the book I wrote that they organized by stealth. You know, we have those like uh, in the military, those, those bombers mm -hmm. you can't pick up on radar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Black women, white men didn't see them, white women really didn't see them, and sometimes even black men, black men didn't see them. Mm -hmm. And so black men were viewed as a threat, but black women, when they said, hey, we're going to protest the buses, the mayor and the white business people just laughed it off or didn't even pay attention. Mm -hmm. Then Joanne Robinson, who made thousands of copies of a handbill calling for a one-day bus boycott, and her point was, we've got to get ahead of the pastors we were going to cut a deal before we do anything if we don't say we're going to boycott the buses. So it was a very organized, and, and throughout the, the um, civil rights movement, it was organizing. So if you think about the, the, the flashpoints of the civil rights movement, I can't think of many that were reactive. Hmm. Hmm. They were advancing, not reacting. And I don't see as much of that as we need right now from followers of Jesus when it comes to racial justice or any justice. Yeah, we're a reactive bunch. Yeah, no, that that's a really, really, really good point, especially in light of report has come out. Black Lives Matter organization, ninety million dollars. Where'd it go? Mm -hmm. Don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they capitalize on the mobilization, but because there was no organization, or there's a technical organization, but there was no organizing. Mm -hmm. The money did they didn't i don't think they knew where to send the money if they could i don't think they had any plan i don't think they had any right. training or background for this they just kind of got, got in the situation by by being loud like you said and being first with the flyer to, to a degree and then and now it's actually a great thing that this money was generated but it needs to go <laughs> where right. it needs to go right so yeah mm -hmm. what do you you know in light of that example what, what would you say there just real quick and i'm curious chuck your response Part of what's going on right now is organizing has become as thin as I've ever seen it. Mm. And part of that is because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Like organizing lives on one-to-one -one connection. Mm. And it gets tested through pulling people together. And I'm thankful for Zoom. I'm thankful we can have this conversation. There are amazing things it can do. Yeah. But there's a lot of limitation mm -hmm. to what can be done virtually. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that right now in the organizations I work with, both with followers of Jesus and those from other faith traditions. We're in a period where we have to rebuild some of that social capital and some of that relational connection. Mm -hmm. And let me say this. There's no such thing as a shortcut to relationship. That's right. Amen. There's no such thing as a shortcut to relationship with God, mm -hmm. a relationship with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And there's no such thing as a shortcut to relationship between fellow human beings and I, there's a temptation in the digital age in the twitter age in the instagram and tiktok age in the zoom age in the what are we on right now in the stream yard age <laughs> to um to think we can microwave and 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 basically accelerate or skip even mm -hmm. the relational component <clears throat> right and right now as a human being i need relationship more than ever that's right isolation is killing me and us as human beings and isolation is an enemy of justice mm. Ooh, isolation is an enemy of, mm -hmm. of god mm. it's not good for us to be alone amen yeah, before yeah. there was a fall right there was something right. that was not good that's right <laughs> right that's good the temptation to go back there yeah. and be alone and so organizing is relational Yes. You can go to a mobilization and not know anybody else there and have a sign. You can go to Twitter and post something in virtue signal, but yeah. not build any relationship. Mm -hmm. The hard work of justice is relational work. Yeah. So, yes. Jack, I don't know what you would add to that. Amen. 
for a, a big a big hearty amen is what I would yes. add. <laughs> and, I, and I'll say again, just taking this to the character of God, um, I'm, I'm indebted to uh, Mike Breen and some of the people that have kind of helped me in the discipleship range around this. But, you know, if you think about the scriptures, there's two through lines throughout the scriptures. One is that God is a God of covenant. The scripture is a covenantal book. It is a covenantal story, and it's to what Troy is saying that you can, you have to be in covenant. You know, in some respects, the people of Montgomery were in covenant with each other, mm. and the power came out of the covenantal relationships that they had. Often, those covenantal relationships were rooted in their faith in the church. Right. Um, but then the Bible is also a story of kingdom, and if you think about kingdom, what does a kingdom do? Kingdoms advance territory. So it's, yes. it goes back to what you said, Alex, about action, and so there's this covenantal. And action that is so needed for change. And that's and again, that's why for me, we we do we do a disservice to the goodness of God and the gospel when we relegate these things to organizations outside of the body of Christ. Yes. And when we're not engaging in it, when I would say we have the DNA, it's in our DNA to be. Yeah organizers. It's in our DNA to be those that are advancing a kingdom of good that helps all people flourish. And then, and it's in our DNA to be in covenant relationship, cross-cultural covenantal relationship, love, yeah. agape love relationship as we do it. And so um, I think it's one of the reasons why I love the civil rights story, because it was about covenant and it was about kingdom. And, and we see what happens when those two are together. And the absence of either doesn't lead to the impact that God calls us to have. Absolutely. No, that's well said. And I appreciate you saying that. And I think uh, one other point, something you said, Troy, you said this wasn't new for Rosa Parks and others. And that when that, so, you know, as kids, we just learn, oh, Rosa Parks didn't get up off her seat, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know and that's it. That's the whole story. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I think that point should not be missed. I tell people all the time, I'm always training. I just don't know what for. Amen. I'm I'm reading every day, not just the Bible, but other books. I'm to people who I I, I agree with and don't agree with. Yes, uh, I'm having conversations with people. I'm studying. I'm thinking. I'm do. I'm always preparing for some conversation somewhere, yeah. sometime. I just don't know when. Yeah. And I think we need to think about our churches that way. That this is these are training centers. These aren't yeah. come and sing and dance and shout. You can do that, but if that's all we do, right? right. And then we go back to work on Monday then what like what if we're not equipping anybody to do more work for the kingdom like you said and the work of <laughs> i'm gonna get in trouble now so the work of being a christian is not done on sunday morning the work of being a christian is not done on sunday morning it's amen. done Monday through Saturday. Amen. amen yeah and so <laughs> sunday is not oh i checked my christian box for the week i did my right. no 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 Sunday should be, uh, we come together and say, man, what'd you do this week? And what'd you do this week? And what's It's halftime adjustments, right? Yeah. It's like going back into the locker room. Yeah. The game was played on the field. You come back yeah. for halftime adjustments. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. So we're on the same page. <laughs> well, and, and I love this idea of what are, what are we, we may not even know we're preparing for, but yeah, we've got to do it for ourselves. And Chuck, I'd love you to just share what you and I and a couple of our colleagues are going to be doing next week. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Speaking of learning. So um, a friend of ours, a colleague in ministry, Andrew Kim is an Asian pastor in Detroit. And um, I think this is his third time doing it. We're going to Los Angeles and we're going to kind of travel up through San Francisco on an Asian American civil rights tour. Wow. So one of the one of the stories of our country, I mean, uh, Daniel, Daniel Lee is uh, out of mm -hmm. Fuller and he we're going to be spending some more time with him, but spend some time with him in preparation for the trip. And he talked about there's 170 years of Asian American history in our country. Wow. And we often think about it like, you know, mm -hmm. they've only been around for 30 years, right? You know, yeah. just or, so, or maybe 50 years. And so um, we're going to go and learn. And so, you know, for the work that we do where we're trying to help other people come to an awareness and an understanding of the story of race in our country and how that plays out in their faith. We want to be in that posture of learning. So really excited. Uh, me, Troy and um, Brittany and Courtney, our, our executive team, we're all going on this learning journey together. We're going to be under the authority of Andrew as our leader and others that are going to be teaching us. We're going to go to the um, the incarceration camps that, that, that they had in Japan. We're going to go to Angel Island, which is the Ellis Island of the West where so many people immigrated. And just um, thinking about that as to your point, continuing to learn, continuing to train, because one of the things I am excited about is I do believe that God is elevating different voices in this conversation mm -hmm. than maybe the black, white, binary voices only. And that's encouraging to me. And yeah. that's very 
kingdom to me. That's very much the church of God to me. I, I couldn't agree more. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to ask both of you, and, and we don't have to spend a lot of time on this just to, well, we, just to address it, though. Um, some groups, maybe you even see this when you tell people what you do. I'm talking about you tell other Christians what you do. Mm-hmm. Some groups don't see the entrenched connection between the desire for racial harmony and the gospel. They don't, they just don't see, they don't see it. Mm-hmm. How do we help people, especially mm-hmm. those in leadership? How do you guys help people? Cause you guys are doing this, help people that may be a little, they may give a little pushback up front when they, when their church wants to do this, this undivided thing. What are y'all talking about race? <laughs> yes. Yes. And you know, they come to the group and they're the, they're the ones that doesn't, doesn't want to talk at first and their yes. arms are crossed. How do you communicate truth to those people? Yeah. Um, Man, such a it's a rich question, right? I mean, a really rich question. I think one of the things first is just to approach it with humility and empathy. Um, in many ways, this this just hasn't been a part of how we've been spiritually formed as followers of Jesus, and it hasn't been how many pastors have been spiritually formed. And so, mm. just trying to have empathy and understanding for that, because I would say, even for me, it's been an awakening and an awareness of how this is a through line through the scriptures. Um, but I think that's where we go. We go to the Bible. We go to the Bible. We recognize, you know, I mean, I think about the promise that God made to Abraham was that you would be a father of all nations. Right. That Mm -hmm. that that through you, all nations on earth will be blessed. So we start to see from the very early parts of the covenantal relationship of even God with the nation of Israel, that this was never just about the nation of Israel. This was about the whole world. It was about the family of God. And, you know, I mean, we could go all through the Bible and point to many other places, but just to come to mind, I mean, I'm always struck by the day of Pentecost, right? Jesus Mm -hmm. makes this promise that the Holy Spirit's going to come and the Holy Spirit chooses to come during a, a festival that brought the diaspora of people together where there would have been those multiple languages Mm -hmm. and people speaking those languages. So when they heard the gospel in their language, that was a miracle. And that was the power of the gospel. Why, why is the coming out party of the Holy spirit a time when there is a diversity of groups that Mm. would have needed to hear the God. I mean, that says something about the nature and the heart of God. And and again, the mission of God. And and obviously you can go to the very end of the scripture, uh, Revelation seven, nine. And I, you know, John has this vision and he says, you know, I've seen, People of every tribe, language, nation, and tongue. And I think about that word um, tr- nation. Every nation is ethnos. He yes. saw different ethnos groups, right? And that's what he's saying. And and even some of those other words speak to differences. And so it's amazing that even in heaven, John sees differences, but what unites them? They're all mm. washed in white robes, right? Yeah. What unites us is the cleansing blood of Jesus and the identity we have as his children, but we don't lose our differences. And so I think one of the things that, Again, I I think a lot of it is imagination. How do we begin to stoke the imagination of God's people and pastors to say, hey, this is core to the story that God has been telling from the very beginning of creation Um, and and, and inviting them into what's the role that we get to play in bringing that story to life? Yeah. Wow. Well said. Mm -hmm. Troy, I'm just pulling up some quotes from what you said that day. (laughs) He was, take, he was taking notes on you. That's right. I was, I was taking notes on both of you. That's <laughs> what I was going to pull out. But on that <laughs> you, know. you said we have to own that we, the church, have not led well on race historically. Mm-hmm. Just, I mean, it's a big, big statement, but just in general, two or three points. So, for example, I remember reading The Color of Compromise last year yep. and just it's not a lot of stuff I didn't know, but there was some stuff that was like, oh, wait, that happened too? Right. Uh, for example, a church in the mm-hmm. 60s, mm-hmm. randomly in North Carolina or somewhere, passing out these flyers in their congregation saying, hey, don't sell your house uh, to a black family. Yeah. That's the stuff. That's those little stuff, those things that go under the radar. But that, that, that wasn't the only church doing that. So, you know, those things were happening too. And I think we're only taught We're only taught about lynching. We're only taught about KKK. We're only taught about uh, uh, voter law. Like we're taught about those, but we're not taught about how how, ubiquitous Mm -hmm. racism had kind of flown throughout all these fallen people and and the organizations that they either created or oversaw. So there's, there's a part, some groups want to just kind of minimize the impact or the outgrowth of what was done, slavery, post-slavery, reconstruction, all that. Mm-hmm. And some groups want to overemphasize it. Mm-hmm. 
but ha- like the truth lies somewhere in the middle, right? And so, what do we as the church need to own just to get history right? Yeah, um, I think that there's so much. Yeah, and I think part of what we need to own is the church has not been perfect, mm. which shouldn't be that difficult to do. Right. And John in his first letter talks about if anyone claims to be without sin, the truth is not in them. Right. I wonder, can we not also say that about a fallen, broken human beings coming together to build the church? In fact, another reason Paul had to write a whole bunch of letters is because the church was broken and imperfect from jump. Right. And so why do we have to tell a, um, mythological story about the church that is pristine and is unable to be critiqued. Mm. So I think the one step we need to make is to be able to own and not even be surprised by it, that the church has failed in some ways historically. Yeah. And that includes race. And that doesn't mean you have to know everything. It doesn't mean you have to read color compromise, right? But it does mean that you have to take some ownership of what's happened in your context, in your congregation, in my congregation. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that that is um, a big part of what we need to recognize. I think not leading well on race, where I get most concerned about it, is when that involves silence and avoidance. Mm-hmm. And, and my, my suspicion is that church you're talking about in North Carolina, those flyers may have been passed out without the pastor formally endorsing it, Hmm. announcing it, preaching about it in a sermon, Hmm. having an elder meeting about it. I bet none of those things happened. Hmm. But because that pastor and that church did not lead well on race, a vacuum got created Hmm. and the pattern of this world took over the culture. Wow. And that continues to happen. And there's a whole host of pastors in the 70s and 80s and 90s who said, I don't want to be Jerry Falwell. I don't want to be Ralph Reed. I don't want to be the more majority or Christian coalition. I don't want to sell out to the Republican Party. So I'm not going to talk about politics. I'm not going to talk about race. I'm going to talk, not going to talk about social issues. Here's the thing. Look at Jesus. Was Jesus cowering before any principality in power. No. Jesus was about forming his followers, his disciples, to be able to think in a godly way and act in a godly way on all these things. And so the consequence of being apolitical and avoiding race and avoiding tension is it's going to bite us, and it's biting us right now in the only way forward is for us to start leading law and race, which means having the courage to engage, to listen, and not to blow things up. I'm always encouraging pastors, starting with a big sermon may not be the way to do it, but how could Undivided come alongside and partner with you? And could we do a living Undivided cohort? Mm-hmm. Or could we do a workshop with some of your people where you can begin some get some of the tools to lead well in race, but also you can learn who are the people in your body who are ready for this because it is a body. I love that imagery, Alex. Yeah. There's someone in the body of Christ in your congregation who God is designed and called into this work of racial healing, solidarity, and justice. Yeah. Let's figure out who they are and get them on that path. Cause they can be the ones to help lead the church in a new and exciting way. Yeah. Amen to that. And I, and I think the other thing with the body part, the body part, the body discussion is the other scripture that says weep with those who weep. Yes. And, you know, yes. I use this example. I, I've broken, <laughs> torn so many different things. I can pick any part on the body and like. <laughs> <laughs> You're my kind of guy. I've got a lot of. <laughs> I've been talking for about uh, eight years. And for the vast majority of those, Chuck has been on crutches or had it. <laughs> so. It's true. It's true. <laughs> well, well, the most recent injury when I I tore this uh, tendon in my chest and bicep, mm-hmm. you know, the doctor told me, the surgeon told me, you don't need that tendon to live. 
It's not necessary to daily function life. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, but I'm 40 or I was at the time. And I'm like, well, it is a pandemic. Can't really do much. This is probably a good time to get surgery because I can't go anywhere. Right. But really what it was is, you know what? At the end of the day, I want my body whole. Yes. I still want to play with my kids. I still want to yes. be active mm -hmm. and I don't need it, but I want my body whole. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a couple components. Number one, if I never acknowledge the pain, that would have been hard for me to not acknowledge. But even if other people didn't acknowledge the pain I was feeling, right? I don't know that I would have got it fixed. Yeah. If I didn't acknowledge, if there was some kind of way that I could have ignored the pain, I don't know I would have done anything. Mm -hmm. But the pain still exists and the body yeah. parts still hurt or damage. And so to bring it back, mm -hmm. if there's people in the body of Christ, if I'm a kingdom minded person, which a lot of people say they are, but they aren't. But if I am and, and, and you know, Tr Troy says, hey, Alex, I'm hurting because of X, Y, Z. My first response should not be, oh, that don't worry about that. That was in the past. That's not my fault. That's yeah. not your, that's right. not my first response. That's it right. might get there. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. probably won't. But it, if it gets there, it shouldn't be the first thing. The first thing I do yeah. is weep with my brother. Amen. Amen. Is Amen. feel his pain and enter into his pain. Amen. And I think like social media has made this worse because it's so easy that when somebody is bold enough or stupid enough, depending on how you look at it, <laughs> to post <laughs> their pain. Yeah. The comment section lets them have oh, it. And now the pain oh, is worse. Absolutely. Yeah. And so this, I love what you said that one-to-one -one relationships, community, and I actually grieve for people like because I have human beings I can talk to in real life about my pain that I don't yes. need to post it on social media. Right. And sometimes I wonder, do people just lack community to the degree that they have to put this online? Which is a, even a worse thing. We know that's true. Yeah. We know yeah. that's true statistically. I mean, there's a loneliness epidemic oh. yeah. in our culture. And, yeah. and and sadly, there are people who don't have any other person they can go to. Oh. I love what you're saying, too. And I, it's one, one of the teachings we give in Undivided is around that. You know, it's funny when you read the Bible, you see different things. And so, you know, common story, we probably, if we read the Bible, have come across Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Mm. And if you know anything about that story, you know, the shortest verse in the Bible is in that story, right? Jesus yeah. wept. First, first verse I ever memorized, right? <laughs> Jesus wept. Um, but isn't it interesting that Jesus wept mm. when he knew for certain mm. that there was about to be a resurrection in yeah. what? Eight minutes, 15 yeah. minutes, 20 minutes. I mean, I don't know how long it was. Right. So, so why did Jesus weep? And it's exactly what you said we're to do with each other. He was able to enter into the pain of others, yeah. even when it wasn't his pain. Mm. That's a powerful picture of how we're called to, to weep with each other. So just to, 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 to just ditto what you said, like Jesus models that so powerfully because he had perfect knowledge of the future in that situation. He knew, he knew, and Amen. yet he went. Yeah. Amazing. Amen. Amazing. Well, <laughs> The quote, it says, the, that moment birthed the calling in me to be a voice for racial justice and an ambassador of healing. Yeah. Yeah. That was you? That was, okay. that was my moment. Yes. Mm -hmm. What was the moment and yeah. what is an ambassador of healing? Because I love that. Yeah. Term. So the moment was really when Undivided was birthed in my, um, the first time it came out of my mouth. But <laughs> so, in 2015, our church did a six week teaching called The Brave Journey. And we do one of these every year where it's kind of like a teaching on steroids where everybody gets in a small group and there's personal work they're going through and then it kind of ties to the weekend message as well. Um, this one was about the moment when Jesus invites Peter to walk on water in the middle of a storm. And we were saying there's places in our lives where Jesus is inviting us to walk on water in the middle of a storm. What's the brave step he's calling you to take? And everybody was on a journey to figure out that was. And that was the moment for me hmm. when in the work that I was doing during the week and kind of preparing to understand what it was for me, that this calling from God became very clear, be a voice yeah. for racial healing, solidarity and justice. So that was the moment for me. Mm -hmm. And as I think about an ambassador for healing, what I define that as, I, and I think I've, I'm honestly, Alex, I'm coming more into this awareness, quite frankly, because of some of the team that God has brought around me that help that are helping me to see this, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that there is a need for repair in this work. And, and that repair has to happen at the heart level. Mm -hmm. It has to happen at the relational level. It has to happen at the organizational or institutional level. And it has to happen at the societal level. And so when I think about the core of what it is that we're trying to do with Undivided, it is about healing. 
-hmm. It is about healing. And I'm also reminded that the New Testament word for salvation actually can be translated as being saved, healed, and delivered. Like it means all of those things. It's yeah. not just about the rescue from the, the penalty of sin and hell, which praise God, it's about that. Um, <laughs> and, but, it, but it is also about healing. Yeah. It is all, it is also about a repairing and a rest and a restoration that's happening. And and so for me, I feel like in, in just this one small sliver, and, and to be clear, there's amazing people doing amazing healing work in the world. There's amazing people doing amazing healing work in this area of race. And we, you know, learn from and are in league with many people who are um, brothers and sisters that are called to the same common cause with us. Um, and in one sliver, what we do hopefully is contributing to that. And, and if it communicates to somebody that this is the way that God loves you and can heal you, then it, then it's, then it's part of the, the kingdom work that we're called to do. And so that's what I would say as an ambassador of healing is like, how can I go around and tell everybody I know that we serve a, a God who is able to save, heal and deliver. It sounds like a song from Motown. A little it bit. does. Save, heal, it does. <laughs> little Stevie wonder. <laughs> <laughs> Here I am, Jesus. <laughs> That's coming. That's coming. Oh, it's coming. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> well, this work for it to be successful takes takes great not just organization, Troy, but great leadership. I know both of you have some leadership experience. I believe Chuck, you were at Procter and Gamble, if I'm mm -hmm. correct. Um, you know, Troy, you've got PhD, and like so, you guys have led churches, led ministries, led different people, led secular, non, you know, Christian, all those different things. And, and I, I do a lot of speaking on leadership as well outside of apologetics. And so I think in many ways, the world rises and falls on leadership. Mm -hmm. um, it's a much broader topic for a different day. But how, what do you think leaders and pastors who are listening or will listening should be doing to help facilitate the work you're engaged in? Should they just bring in your organization? Should they, what are, what should they be doing? And not just what should they be doing, but how do we get them to do it now? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, a couple things come to mind. And one is, I mean, it, it's kind of a revolutionary uh, definition of a leader. And that is leaders have followers. Surely not revolutionary. <laughs> yeah. We learn this with follow a leader, follow the leader as a kid, right? right? <laughs> You're only a leader if people are actually following you. And so <clears throat> when I think about leadership when it comes to racial healing, solidarity and justice and reconciliation, who are you leading? Who are you leading and in what way? And <clears throat> um, Chuck and I are both, uh, are both friends with Dave Ferguson. He's a pastor in Chicagoland area, leads yep. uh, exponential new thing. And Dave has this, this thing, and I've, I've experienced this from Dave a lot in my life. I've known Dave since I was 17. Uh, he, has, he says that the four most important letters in the alphabet are I-C-N-U. Mm. And it is, if you're a pastor, you're a leader, are you looking around and seeing something in other people? Yeah. in inviting them into that. Yeah. He talks about that in Hero Maker, which is a, a That's exactly what I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah, right. yep. the Hero Maker. Mm -hmm. And I believe in that. I think I think a lot of times as leaders we think about the content or the concepts or the direction and all that is important. Mm -hmm. And if it never translated translates into people and their leadership and making heroes out of those around us, we're not going to get where we want to go. And it's why I, I say the goal is not to preach one. I remember Brian McLaren saying this 25 years ago. If you were a white pastor in Mississippi in 1962, <clears throat> all white congregation, and somehow you got clear on the sin of racism and segregation and Jim Crow, there's three ways you could lead. <clears throat> One is that next Sunday you could preach the sermon of your life. Mm -hmm. And on Monday, you would not have a pastor anymore, but you could probably go north as a hero. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. second option would be to ignore it. Mm -hmm. And a third would be the hard work of leading well, mm -hmm. which would probably mm -hmm. be a multi-year endeavor. Mm 
Yeah. And I'm not saying we're in the same situation as Mississippi 1962. Right. Sometimes when we wake up, we may not feel like we're that far removed from it either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you're called to a situation, one of the choices to lead, to make is to lead. And that means thinking about your people, praying for your people, and inviting those who are ready to step on this adventure with you. Do nothing alone as a pastor or leader. Mm -hmm. yeah. Far too many pastors or leaders, when they are confronted by racism mm -hmm. in their own lives and in the church, they go a lonely path. Yeah. It ends in a lot of agony. Uh, and I'm not saying the path together is, is one that's filled with comfort. Mm -hmm. Right. It's going to be filled with agony as well, but there's something about go through, going through agony together and also the promise of what we can do together that I think is, a, I think it's the kingdom path. Amen. Yes. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, uh, so we talk about leaders and, and their role and what they should be doing and getting involved and why. What can the average person do to kind of facilitate this racial harmony? Um, they're not maybe going to run a cohort or a church, but mm -hmm. just in one to one conversations, mm -hmm. what are some 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 tips or some practical tips you can give all of us that we can we can have in our tool bag when we go into conversations that could be contentious if we don't handle it right? That's good. Yeah, um, a couple things come to mind. One is if you're a follower of Jesus, I encourage you um, get, get get into what the Bible has to say about this topic. You know, I mean, there's so many great resources. I'm trying to think of one off the top of my head that I would recommend, but even just um, searching for all the places where the word unity shows up in the Bible mm. or nations show up in the Bible and begin to just study that. Ephesians 2 is a passage that I think is a really helpful passage to study on this. So I think that's number one is just um, letting yourself be grounded. And, and, and Troy said this about leaders, and I think it's also true for every individual. Don't go all alone. Don't go it alone. Alex, you talked about a group you've been in for a couple of years now, right? Where there's a commitment to relationship across the differences right. of race. And, right. you know, and I don't know, maybe maybe for someone that happens through people they're in relationship with at work, maybe it happens at their school, maybe it happens in their community group, whatever it is, maybe it can happen at your church if your church is diverse. Um, but finding a way to make a commitment, you know, I think about Troy and I, um, what God has birthed in us has been birthed in our relationship. And continues to be birthed and refined and defined in our relationship with each other. Our, our connection with each other is a big part of what is now undivided, you know, and, and, and I think that's the way God wants it to be. Um, I'm a better leader because of him. That's right. Even now we're, we're together <laughs> in the same place because of that. Right. So, you know, I'm, I'm the leader I am in large part because I have Troy influencing me to be that leader. Yeah. Right. And, um, and, and so I think that's another thing that I would say to people. And the reason I say that is because oftentimes people want to know what's the book list. Give me oh. a book list. <laughs> and I'm all for reading. I've, I've probably read a lot of books. I can make a list for you. <laughs> um, but what I've learned in relationship with my brother, Troy, would fill volumes yes. of books, right? Yes. I've learned more from that relationship than I would learn from reading every book that's been written on this topic ad infinitum. And yes. the relationship is so key. Amen. I, I, I tell people a lot of times with regards to uh, parenting, really, or marriage, yeah. like there's a, I would say there's a lot of books on marriage, but there's also no book on marriage Amen. for you. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You know, there's a lot of books on parenting, but there's no book on your kids. That's right. That's <laughs> so, right. You know, I, I love that because because we're all human. We're different. We're nuanced. Yeah. There's there's you know books have to by definition kind of grind down to some kind of central theme, right? But we don't all fit neatly into a central theme, and so you got to be in relationship with people, mm -hmm. um, man. So as we as we leave, uh, what else are y'all working on? And you don't even have time to work on anything else. I know, but <laughs> like, what's what's next? Yeah. It sounds counterintuitive to say this. We are writing a book together. So I guess I should say that. Um, that's going to come out. Actually, won't come out until 2024. So we're um, taking time with this project. Um, okay. But the things that we're doing, are, our team is, you know, I, I'm excited about things that Troy's doing. I mean, we're seeing in places like Chicago, Detroit, 
Huntsville, Alabama, teams of people coming together through Undivided and really beginning to build relationships and collaborate and imagine what it looks like to do justice in their communities. And so, um, and we're really interested. I mean, you know, you talked about our, our website, undivided.com. If there's somebody who's feeling stirred and says, hey, I'd love to think about what that looks like in my community, we'd love to talk with you because um, we're, we're building training and processes that will help really unleash people's ability to organize, not just mobilize for justice in their city. Awesome. And Troy? I mean, I think that what is becoming clear to me, at least, is um, the power of the work we do with Undivided, our living Undivided experiences, six weeks, two hours a week across race and ethnicity. It's about relationship. You don't download it and watch it at your leisure. You're coming together and having experience and sharing story together. I think that's vital. We're committed to that over time and team to share that with congregations, with businesses, wherever, whoever will invite us in, we want to partner on that. Mm -hmm. And the other is there's an increasing number of followers of Jesus who say, okay, I'm convinced systemic and structural racism are historically true and continue to be true. I don't know what to do about it. Mm -hmm. So we're beginning to do more and more work around training and teaching and, and coaching through not the theory of it, but the praxis of mm -hmm. doing justice. Mm -hmm. wow. And so if someone out there wants to go on that journey, we're trying to figure out how to equip that and scale that up. We're experimenting a lot in 2023 and want to have a, a lot of opportunities for that in the future years. So if you're interested in that conversation, please get in touch with us mm -hmm. at undivided.com. Sounds good. Well, I thank you both for being here with me. Um, I really enjoyed this discussion, really enjoyed meeting you, and hopefully I'll see you again soon. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. We'll definitely Thanks. be coming through the shy sometime. So yeah, and I, I got to get some Lumal Nottis when I'm there. Okay. Hey, I got you on that. Yeah. <laughs> it's my favorite pizza. That's right. It's mine, too. We're hey. undivided on that. We're yeah. undivided yeah. on that. That's good. That's good. <laughs> See, Although if I, we were going to New York, we would have a different answer. I know. See, I got some New York people watching, and they're going to they're gonna have a squabble after this is done. That's so. right. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Well, until next time, peace. Thank you.